Okay. Good morning, everyone. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning to invite your spirit into our midst. And uh, we ask, Lord, that uh, you can teach us and help us in our day-to-day -day lives as we struggle in this world of sin and suffering, as we live in a world that is consumed by fear of the things that are coming upon this earth. We ask, Lord, that we can have a peace and a confidence in you, um, that we can trust that you are guiding our lives and that um, you are correcting us when we are in error. We give our hearts to you and ask that you can do a work in us, that we can reflect Christ's character. We pray for understanding as we address the topic of this study, uh, dealing with looking at Louis F. Weir and uh, the criticism that David H. Thiel has against his views. We ask, Lord, that we can clearly understand these things and apply them to our lives. We pray for one another, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again, everyone. Now, we did get off to a false start, so I don't have my uh, document up yet. But just to kind of do a quick review as we're um, getting ready for that. So we have gone through Uriah Smith's thoughts on Daniel. We started with chapter 12, actually, while I was in Australia. And then we went back and did chapter 10 and chapter 11. Now, the reason we looked at Uriah Smith's thoughts on Daniel is we knew that Uriah Smith had views that differed from our own. Now, this movement has been founded upon a repeat of Millerite history with understanding that the verses of Daniel 11, verse 40 to, uh, 40 to 45, well, starting with 45b, or 40b, pardon me, lead us to from the period from 1989 to the Sunday law, that they're addressing those events. Uriah Smith believes that those verses, uh, 41 onward, well, I guess it would be 44, 45, are dealing with the Crimean War. So he's looking at Daniel 11, verse 36, as applying to not the papacy as we understand it, as James White understood it, but that it applies to France. So there are these differing views that we have with Uriah Smith. Now, Ellen White makes a statement, and she makes a few statements regard, regarding Uriah Smith's um, that people use. So one is that uh, the book, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, is God's helping hand. People see that as an endorsement of everything that's in the book. She also does make some statements regarding Uriah Smith uh, doing some presentations dealing with the Eastern question. And uh, so people take that as an endorsement. And so one of the things we're going to look at is how do we consider things endorsements or not endorsements? Uh, how do we know when Ellen White is commenting on something uh, that she's in agreement with all of it or some of it? Uh, these are, are major questions that we have to, to answer. And we know that she will make statements uh, such as the pioneers had the correct view on the daily, and we'll take that as an endorsement that the pioneers had a correct view on the daily. She'll say, I recommend uh, the article by Crozier in the Daystar uh, to every saint. So does that mean everything in that article by Crozier is correct? She'll talk about uh, the true midnight cry given by Samuel Snow. Does that mean then that everything uh, that Samuel Snow wrote in the August 22nd, 1844 article called The True Midnight Cry is then to be accepted as truth. Now, we know that often Ellen White will endorse something but have some views that differ. So there is this, this problem of how do we sort through that? It's obviously not just a simple, straightforward thing that if she endorses something, then it must be all true because we know uh, that that's, um, that there are things in things that she endorses that she would differ on. Now, uh, just got this document here. I got to join on this computer here. So I'm doing some things while I'm talking to you. 
uh, trying to get this set up. So where we're going to jump in in this uh, paper by David H. Thiel. So David H. Whoops. David H. Thiel is a uh, friend of mine on Facebook. Um, I became friends with him just because of his last name, Thiel. And, and I knew he was an Adventist, so if I asked if he was related to Edwin Thiel. He said he wasn't, um, if I remember correctly. So anyway, I'm friends with him. I've, I've had some discussions with him regarding uh, this paper. And uh, so he's pretty committed to uh, the views that he holds here. And, you know, that's understandable. Obviously, when we have views, uh, we've, we've spent some time thinking about it. And so sometimes we can be emotionally attached to our views. And none of us are immune to that. Sometimes we can get emotional when, when a view is attacked. So we had some discussion yesterday regarding, you know, how we come to understand truth and how we present truth. These things are important. It is important that we, we allow people to make their own decisions, but also that we present things in a way that doesn't color or misrepresent the views of others. So when we're, when we're looking at this paper, one of the things we're trying to do is be very fair to David Thiel. So there I can finally, it's starting to respond. I think part of it is my computer had to restart and it was pretty sluggish. Now, this is just the beginning of the paper. I got to get to the right page. So just hang on. So we had gone through quite a bit of this and I know where we're at. I'm not sure what I don't remember what page I was on. So we looked at that. We looked at that unfulfilled prophecy. Okay. Didn't know we'd got this far. Ah, here it is. So this is where we are. Okay. Connection between the wo woes of Revelation and the work of the King of the North in Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, would be made by Uriah Smith. And the 1862 to 1872 Sabbath school participants that contributed the material to what would initially uh, be initially published in 1881 as the now combined Daniel and Revelation. So we know that uh, Dwight got together uh, the documents dealing with Daniel, uh, the studies on Daniel. And, and what year did that the studies on Daniel start? Do you remember, Dwight? So he had originally done the Sabbath school starting in 1862, dealing with thoughts on Revelation. These are published in the Redeem and Herald. And then... When did he start the studies on the book of Daniel? I'm looking it up. Okay. So it's, it, so first revelation. So this is a period of, you know, 10 plus years, I guess, that they did these uh, studies that Uriah Smith had put together. So here he talks about the participants contributed material to what would initially be published in 1881 as this Excuse book, me. Daniel and Revelation. Okay. The... Yeah. Study began by by the date printed in the Review and Herald on the fifth of January of eighteen sixty nine, but it actually began on the fifth of January. Or excuse me, according to the Review and Herald, it began the fifth of January eighteen sixty eight, but actually began fifth of January eighteen sixty nine. Right, because they forgot to change the the year. Correct. Yeah. Okay. It concluded. On the 18th of July of 1871. Okay. Yeah. So we have that July 18th date in there. Correct. Now, how come he has here 1872? Quite honestly, I cannot speak for what he was doing. Okay. So, um, and, and we, we never did look at the thoughts on Revelation. We never put those together. You just were looking at the Daniel section. I can I can put together the thoughts on Revelation, yes, and those occurred, I believe, before he did the thoughts on Daniel. Yeah, yeah. So starting in eighteen sixty two, even before the Adventist Church was officially formed. So I'll yeah. look. Okay, well, yeah. So it'd just be helpful to get some of that information together. So they're gonna first look at uh, the material studied from eighteen sixty two, cover the prophecies of Revelation. First published in 1867. So in 1867, they're going to put that together. 
And five years later, the Prophecies of Daniel were published as a companion volume. In this volume, as well as the combined volumes published in 1881, the Crimean, the Crimea War, or the Crimean War, was recognized as a fulfillment of Daniel 1144. So basically what Theo is saying here is this was something that was the result of Bible study, not just of Uriah Smith, but of the church in general in Sabbath school uh, format, published in the Review and Herald and later published in books. And and that would be one of the reasons, he's not stating this here explicitly, but one of the reasons why we should accept it. Um, and then he's going to talk here about Dr. Clark. That's Adam Clark, commentator, who wrote in 1825, which is quoted by Smith in part. Regarding verse 44, he says, But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. This part of the prophecy is allowed to be yet, is allowed to be yet unfulfilled. And what is portended, the course of prophetic events will show. Were we to understand it as applied to Antiochus, then the news might be of the preparations which he heard, that the provinces of the east and Artaxes, king of Armenia on the north, were intending to rise up against him. But if the Turkish power be understood, as in the preceding verses, it may mean that the Persians on the east and the Russians on the north will at some time greatly embarrass the Ottoman government. So back in 1825, Adam Clark is looking at what's happening with the Ottoman Empire and applying these verses. So Uriah Smith and, and the pioneers are all looking at these events that are you know, contemporary events as some having some part in fulfillment of this prophecy. Now they recognize it as at this time in 1825 as unfulfilled. Uriah Smith is going to say that it became fulfilled. So he's going to take, and, and we could put look at a parallel, how we look at what Lewis F. Weir predicted and what happened as a parallel to what Adam Clark predicted and what happened. That's one of the things that we could do. We could say, well, there's some, Similarities there. We have uh, somebody making a prediction regarding Daniel 11, and it comes true, according to Uriah Smith. And we had somebody, Lewis F. Weir, making a prediction regarding Daniel 11, and it has come true as well. So we're going to have to examine that and see what differences there are and what, what's consistent and what's inconsistent. Smith would then elaborate on just how these events occurred long after the death of Adam Clark in 1832, the same year in which Miller began preaching on the subject of Christ's second coming. The nature of Clark's prediction would have had as striking an influence upon Smith, whether or not it brought about a change of previous position, and others, just as the prediction Josiah Litch had made regarding the end of the second woe, would have ha would have upon those in the Valley of Decision up to the time of its fulfillment on August 11th, 1840. Between this conjecture of Dr. Clark's written in 1852, uh, the Crimean War of 1853 to 1856, so this is, um, I believe this is uh, Uriah Smith here, there is a striking, certainly a striking coincidence inasmuch as the very powers he mentions, the Persians on the east and the Russians on the north, were the ones which instigated that conflict. Tidings from these powers troubled him, Turkey. Their attitude and movements incited the Sultan to anger and revenge. Russia, being the more aggressive party, was the object of attack. Turkey declared uh, war on her powerful northern neighbor in 1853. The world looked on in amazement to see a government which had long been called the sick man of the East, a government whose army was dispirited and demoralized, whose treasuries were empty, whose rulers were vile and imbecile, and whose subjects were rebellious and threatening succession, rush with such impetuosity into the conflict. The prophecy said that they should go forth with great fury. And when they thus went forth in the war aforesaid, they were described in the profane vernacular of the American writer as fighting like devils. 
England and France, it is true, soon came to the help of Turkey, but she went forth in the manner described and, as is reported, gained important victories before receiving the assistance of these powers. Okay, so that is, um, yeah, just Uriah Smith, as I thought. Okay, so here Uriah Smith is looking at Daniel 11, um, uh, verse 44, and applying this to uh, this war, what they call the Crimean War. So Theo goes on, a further understanding of the connection between the Russo-Turkish War and the Crimea War, I guess their connection between these wars, is best understood as a political military strategy for maintaining the status quo. Britain was king of the seas, the world premier navy. Russia wanted to challenge the grip over the oceans Britain had maintained, but lacked a warm water harbor from which to launch a navy year-round. Russia could only navigate when her northern ports were not icebound in winter, greatly hindering economical and military aspirations. With the demise of French military supremacy at the end of the Seven Years' War, some called uh, World War Zero for its global extent, Russia correctly surmised that it could successfully war against the Ottoman Empire to acquire its most coveted warm water harbor. Thus concluded the matter just before the French Revolution. Russia hoped to further her aspirations in 1853, though there was no formal, dec formal dec declaration of war by Turkey until October. Conflict had already occurred in the Balkans. Russia had tired of having her navy bottled up in the Black Sea, unable to freely pass through the Straits of Constantinople without Ottoman permission. Great Britain did not want the Russian Navy to have free access to the Eastern Mediterranean, where the British happily dominated. When the Turks obtained guarantees that France and Britain would come to aid them, they formally declared war on Russia in October. But Europe was slow to fulfill their promises. French and British troops didn't mobilize in any useful fashion until after June 1854. Karl Marx acerbically remarked, on the tardiness of Europe's response. There, there they are, the French doing nothing and the British helping them as fast as possible. Uh, when the Crimean War ended, Russia had lost its bid for supremacy in the Eastern Mediterranean. Its Black Sea fleet destroyed along with the fortifications at Sevastopol. Uh, the ruined prestige suffered by Russia only fermented as a desire for revenge in the future. The Ottoman Empire was weakened further because of influence lost in the Balkans and the ruinous debt created by the conflict. From the end of the Crimean War to the end to the next conflict with Russia, the Ottoman Empire confronted several rebellions and uprisings in which thousands of Christians died. In 1860, during the crisis in Lebanon, as many as 12,000 people died in the violence, which led to reprisal killings in Damascus, where as many as 25,000 lost their lives. Between 1866 and 1869, a revolt in Crete, uh, about 750 people were slaughtered without quarter after surrendering. The Bulgarian uprising in 1876 ended with up to 30,000 massacred. Some modern historians calculate the number to be as high as 100,000. In addition to these atrocities would come the terrible persecution of Armenian Christians between 1879 and 1915, resulting in over 1.5 million deaths. The word genocide was coined in 1944 to describe the massacre in 1915, as well as the Holocaust events of World War II. The history of these events in the Ottoman Empire were well publicized and known to preachers like A.G. Daniels and J.M. Lothborough, who presented sermons on the Eastern question. Meanwhile, unfolding news in Italy would continue to cause and foster skepticism regarding the papacy as the king of the north, providing us with the backstory for why Uriah Smith may have switched from holding the view of the papacy as the king of the north to Turkey being such as claimed by Weir, even though the evidence appears to be in this age of digitalization lacking in its availability. Okay, so I'm not quite sure what he's referring to here. So he's probably going to have to expand on this. I'm not sure what he's talking about here. Uh, 
Anyway, so as we go through this, we can see Thiel's going through how, what these events were, these historical events, and um, how Uriah Smith and um, Adventists at, at the turn of the century, going from the 19th to the 20th century, would have viewed these events uh, happening with Turkey. Never truly independent since Napoleon's conquest, Italy was made up of a smattering of small states waiting for the right person or persons to reunite them into a modern nation. The Vatican was among these states and still maintained a small army of professional soldiers, which included the Swiss guards that still exist to protect the Pope as his personal bodyguard. With the emergence of such personalities like Victor Emmanuel II, King of Sardinia, Piedmont since 1849, Camillo, Paolo, Filippo, Guilillo, Benzo, Count of Cavour. It's all these different people. I'm not going to say all their names. All the way up to Pope Pius IX, the longest reigning pope up to that time in history. Um, unfolded History unfolded in such a manner as to indicate that the papacy was not the king of the north. Now, does that even make sense? So what is his argument here of why the papacy is not the king of the north? What, what's, how is he applying this? So he's saying that there's, you know, Italy is all these independent states. You know, the Vatican is just one of these or um, these states. How does this apply to uh, history unfolding in such a manner as to indicate the papacy was not the king of the north? He's trying. He's, he's trying for a literal application that is just not logical. Right. So. He has this literal application of what the king of the north is. It's based upon which territory you occupy. And he's saying here at this time, the papacy doesn't really occupy that territory. It can't be the king of the north, right? But we're looking at this from a biblical perspective. And, and I think that's part of the problem when we look at, at these, these kingdoms. What is the purpose of God? telling us about Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. What, what is the significance of these nations? Why, why is God even addressing them? Because they come in contact with God's people. Right. Okay. So they come in contact with God's people. It, it has to do with God's people. Now, who are God's people at the end of the world? Are we looking to the Jews in Jerusalem as God's people? No. No. So we know we have this change. We have a change from the Jews. And, and we have all these prophecies that address it. Right. We have the prophecies of Daniel. Daniel chapter nine is important, not just because it points to Christ as our savior and as the center of all prophecy, but because it also shows the transition from literal Israel to spiritual Israel. This is a basic principle that Adventism uh, has accepted and understood. It's part of the Millerite movement. And yet the Millerites weren't consistent in how they applied literal and spiritual. So Miller's rules are correct, but Miller didn't always follow his own rules. And, and his followers definitely didn't always follow Miller's rules, right? Just because we have some rules set up doesn't mean we necessarily always follow them. Now, we understood that Rome became the king of the north, that is pagan Rome, when it conquered Syria, right? So when it conquered Greece, Rome became the king of the north. And then we see in Daniel 11 of the papacy, when we have the daily being taken away and the abomination of desolation set up, we recognize that that's the papacy. Now, is the papacy... Uh, just the same as pagan Rome? Is it a secular power? No. Okay, right. Now, it needs secular power to support it, right? And we see in Revelation 17, when we see uh, the woman riding the beast, committing fornication with the nations of this world, that that, that, that power is a religious power combined with secular power. And we know that the papacy receives a deadly wound in 1798. That is, 
it no longer has the support of the secular powers, correct? Agreed. Yeah. Now, this is slowly going to be healed, right? We're going to have, you know, the Vatican uh, with the 1929, uh, what's it called? What is that uh, event called? Slips my mind. You mean that accord in 1929? Yeah. What's it called? Just a minute. <laughs> we, we, I, I, I mean, I know what it is. I just can't think of the word. I know the Lateran Treaty. The Lateran Treaty. That's it. Okay. So the Lateran Treaty. And and some people say, well, that's when the Debbie wound was healed. And, and Theo mentions this. And then, you know, well, maybe it was later. No. Maybe it's going to be when the Sunday law happens, which is when I believe that really it is healed. Um, but we also see in Revelation 13, we see that uh, the leopard-like beast, which is, of course, the papacy, and then the two horned beasts, the United States, the parts that these have to play in prophecy. So all of these are extremely important that when we put together this whole story, it doesn't make sense to... Uh, apply Daniel 11 in those final verses uh, to, to literal events as we do in the earlier portion of Daniel. Because we know that we have moved from the daily to the abomination of desolation. And we also have moved from uh, the literal Jews in Palestine to the church. And that has to be taken into account. So when he says that they're not the king of the north, he's saying that because of how he's understanding what the king of the north is. Okay, so he goes on. Events would transpire uh, until Victor Emmanuel II would win by conquest the lands held by Pope Pius IX, famous for his statements regarding papal infallibility and assertions of the Virgin Mary's role in Roman Catholic doctrines in 1870. So we know that date in 1870 when papal infallibility is put into law or whatever you want to call it, voted on at the Vatican Council. That's going to be July 18th, 1870. Okay. Simply put, the papacy had received its deadly wound in 1798 and continued to bleed out until it could no longer function as an internationally recognized sovereign state, having fallen under the civil jurisdiction of a whimsical Italian parliament. For eight years, Pius IX would be known as the prisoner of the Vatican. Of these events, James White appears to make a case that prophecy was being fulfilled or on the verge of fulfillment, writing some very strong, some very startling events relative to the papacy, filling up the prophecies uttered in this chapter concerning that power, have taken place within a few years of the present time, commencing in 1798, where the great national judgment fell upon the papacy. What have been the chief characteristics of its history? Answer, the rapid defection of its natural supporters and greater assumptions on its own part, um, assumptions of power. At the close of the 2300 days of chapter eight in 1844, judgment of another kind began to sit, namely the investigative judgment in the heavenly sanctuary preparatory to the coming of Christ. December 8, 1854, the dogma, dogma of the Immaculate Conception was decreed by the Pope. July 21st, 1870, in the Great Ecumenical Council assembled at Rome, it was deliberately decreed by a vote of 538 against two that the Pope was infallible. Now, he is here July 21st instead of July 18th. Um, not sure why, but anyway, we, we, we understand it to be July 18th. Here he is, July 21st. Another symbolic date, but I, I don't know that that's the correct one. In the same year, Napoleon III, by whose bayonets the Pope was kept upon his throne, was crushed by Prussia, and the last prop was knocked from under the papacy. Then Victor Emmanuel, seizing his opportunity to carry out the long-cherished dream of the United Italy, seized Rome to make it the capital of his kingdom. To his troops under General Cadorna, Rome surrendered September 20th, 1870. Then the last vestige of the temporal power departed. Nevermore, said Victor Emmanuel, to be restored. And the Pope has been virtually a prisoner in his own palace since that time. 
Because of the great words which the horn uttered, Daniel saw the beast destroyed and given to the burning flame. This destruction is to take place at the second coming of Christ. And by means of that event, for the man of sin is to be consumed by the spirit of Christ's mouth and destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Second Thessalonians 2 verse 8. What words could be greater, more presumptuous, more blasphemous, more insulting to high heaven than the deliberate adoption of the dogma of infallibility, clothing a mortal man with the prerogative of the deity? which was accomplished by a papal intrigue and influence on July 21st, 1870. Following a swift succession, the last vestige of temporal power was swept from his grasp. It was because of these words, and as if in almost immediate connection with them, that the prophet saw this power given to the burning flame. His dominion was to be consumed unto the end, implying that when the last vestige of this power was consumed as a civil ruler, the end is not far off. Okay, so obviously James White is referring to some of these events, but James White is not having the same interpretation as Uriah Smith regarding these verses of Daniel 11, verse 44, and so forth. Now he goes on to talk about this. Though James White thought he had fresh evidence to support his view on the papacy coming to his end, he really had no grounds for strong objections against the application of the Crimean War to Daniel 11, 44. Enough time had passed since the Crimean War, nearly 20 years by the time of the commentary on Daniel as a standalone book was published, that a fanatical interest could not be fomented by decades old news. This could not have excited his concerns about moving too quickly on prophecy as yet unfulfilled. Certainly the papacy had done nothing between 1798 and 1870 to give even a weak appearance of fulfilling Daniel 11 verse 40 to 44. On the other hand, Turkey appeared to be fulfilling the prophecy. Now, that would be true, right? So between 1798, that is Daniel 11, verse 40a, and Daniel 11, verse 40b, we can't take this history as having to anything to do with the papacy, right? That is, it doesn't give us in Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, what the papacy is doing from 1798 until the close of probation, right? So I'm not sure how this, this helps his argument. Do you understand what I'm saying here? He's saying, well, nothing was done after 1798. But he's saying, well, since the papacy wasn't fulfilling that, but we can see Turkey fulfilling that, then Turkey must be the power. So what's the problem with his argument here? How, how could we frame this? Because I think James White is correct that Uriah Smith is moving too quick, quickly on unfulfilled prophecy. He's looking for fulfillment of prophecy in his time so that he can, he's, he's looking at the headlines, so to speak. He's looking at the news and events that have happened to try to fit that into Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. And, and so he can find ways to fit Turkey into that. But James White's objection to that is that the papacy must be the final power that's being addressed, not Turkey, because none of the other lines of prophecy address Turkey. So what is Theo missing here? How would we characterize that? I mean, we know that he doesn't, he's not addressing our views at all, right? So... But but he is addressing Weir, and and is Weir saying that you know that somehow that the papacy is fulfilling prophecies in that period from 1798, in this time that the deadly wound has occurred from 1798, is the papacy doing things all the way through that history that are shown in that prophecy? Would we expect that it is? Yes. Okay, in the prophecy itself, Daniel 11, verse 40a to Daniel 11, verse 40b, it doesn't tell us what the papacy is doing once it receives its deadly wound. Right. It's going to tell us what's going to happen, which is what Louis F. Weir says. He says, well, they received a deadly wound in 1798, and they're going to respond 
the king of the north is going to respond at the end of the world with the armies of the United States. So this argument that Thiel is making, that the papacy wasn't doing anything in this period, is, is moot in the context of what Weir is saying, right? I don't know that it's moot, but I could I could agree that this is very much a, a fallacious argument. He's not... Yeah. It, because he's trying to approach this from a literal standpoint rather than a figurative standpoint, he's making misapplications. Yeah. But he knows Weir's interpretation would right. not require that the papacy is is described in Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, until the events of 1989, what he's going to predict. He doesn't say they're 1989, but what happens in 1989 is the response. And so we are saying, well, we still haven't had that response of the papacy to the king of the south, being France, right, at that time in 1798. And so, so this argument is pointless. The argument that Thiel is making is pointless in regard to what Weir is saying. That is, it's it's not in any way refu refuting what Weir is saying. To say that the papacy had done nothing between 1798 and 1870 to give even a weak appearance of fulfilling Daniel 11, verse 40 to 44, neither, well, we don't have Weir saying that, that that is occurring or has occurred, right? He's not trying to apply those verses to the period after the papacy has received the deadly wound. And James White is looking at this weakening of the papacy. And then he says, well, you know, we have the papal of infallibility, right? That, that's going to come along. So this is showing that that there is at this time that its power, its temporal power is swept away, right? Because of the claims of the papacy. So James White is addressing more dealing with the deadly wound and what's happening to the end of the papacy in that period than to the verses, you know, of 41 to 45, right? He's not trying to find a fulfillment of those verses since 1798. James White isn't. So I, I don't understand Thiel's argument. I don't understand what he's trying to show here. So he's saying, of course, we can't find the papacy fulfilling those events, 40 to 45, or 40 to 44, as he lists here. But we're not looking for that. We're saying that the, the prophecy is addressing events at the end of the world not the events from 1798 to, you know, you know all the, all that history through there. It, it's just going to show us the so deadly bad. wound and the response. What, Jeff? Oh, nothing, nothing. I'm good. <laughs> okay. So I, I don't understand what he's trying to do here. I mean, I understand what he's trying to do. He's trying to support Uriah Smith's view by showing that Uriah Smith's view is tenable, but he's not really addressing anything about what Lewis F. Weir is saying and why his view would be wrong. And the support he has here from James White isn't, you know, James White thought he had fresh evidence to support his view on the papacy coming soon to his end. I don't think that's actually what James White is saying. He believes that the deadly wound had yeah. happened. Yeah. No, the deadly wound is, is the process of the papacy. You know, from beginning to end. Yeah. You know, it's the process. Well, then, it's a, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he received his deadly wound. And, and what James White is showing is that, you know, the papacy has not gained any power. His coming to his end, James White understands, is going to happen dealing with the Sunday law and so forth. Right. So it doesn't really make sense what Thiel is trying to get from James White. James White isn't making the argument that Thiel says he's making, and definitely Weir doesn't make that argument. But, you know, maybe he'll address this later on. 
We would certainly agree with White that the papacy had fallen even lower than before the proclamation of the second angel's message, proclaimed uh, shortly after 1844. Uh, this new evidence would certainly be the kind of revelation of the new and greater fall associated with the mighty angel of Revelation 18, verse 1 and 2. But what James White did with these events is the very thing Uriah Smith did with events involving Russian Ottoman Empire. And then White rebukes Smith and others for focusing on unfulfilled prophecy as though it were the hope of greater future light, while ignoring or taking for granted the present light on the pilgrim's path pathway. So these are unequal, you know, unequal criticisms. I don't, I don't know how else to frame it here. So James White is not moving too fast on unfulfilled prophecy. Because we have many, many prophecies that address the papacy at the end of the world. Where James White has problems with Smith is that he's focusing on this unfulfilled prophecy that doesn't line up with anything else that we have, right? They're, they're not equal. You can't put what James White is doing on the same ground as what Smith is doing in regard to prediction of events. So he goes on, he says, James White had valid concerns regarding the attempts to predict the war now in progress between Turkey and Russia, the Russo-Turkish War, 1877-1878, which is connected to the Crimean War, as well as the terrible events affecting Christians in that region leading up to that conflict. Had society, um, which had society hyperventilating on the Eastern question as an imminent fulfillment of Armageddon. It's severely curtailed offerings by which church debt, church debt might be reduced. But instead of offering a divergent view to curtail the infuse, enthusiasm, White should have been offering an increase in prayers for people to acquire gold refined in the fire, a spotless robe of Christ's righteousness, and the eye salve of the Holy Spirit, so that people under the influence of the Holy Spirit would have moved them to bring their tithes and offerings into the storehouse. Okay. Well, I, I can only say, wow, but that's not really an argument. So what what is Thiel trying to say here? That the James White shouldn't have said what he said regarding the papacy should be, we should look to the papacy as the fulfillment of these things, but he should have focused upon us developing a Christ-like character. Uh, didn't James White focus upon us developing a Christ-like character? These, th these two things aren't mutually exclusive. A any thoughts on this? That's probably where, uh, which we call Louis, Louis, Louis F. Ware's book, The Moral Purpose of Prophecy, <laughs> might come in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it, 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 it is such a... Um, I mean, I, I could use the word the narrow perspective, but this is it's not really it's not really addressing clearly what the problem is here. The idea of what Smith was doing, if if it was wrong, uh, to say that James White shouldn't have have put caution on it, um, because I think what Thiel is trying to say here is that that the failure, like these events, my my understanding of what Thiel has said is that that these events. Uh, would have led to the second coming of Christ. Um, they were the fulfillment of prophecy. Um, but the failure was in the church. The church wasn't ready. So that's why this prophecy failed. That, that seems to me from the conversations I've had with Thiel and, uh, and what I've seen in the paper, that that's his view. So basically the idea is Uriah Smith was right, uh, but the church wasn't ready. And I remember Parminder back in 2019. Um, this would have been maybe June or July. He was uh, talking about how um, that Josiah Litch and Uriah Smith were correct in regard to their understanding of Daniel 11, verse 36 uh, to 45. That is, he was, he was, he was saying that uh, this view was correct. And, and basically he was buying into this idea that there is sort of conditional ways in which prophecies are fulfilled. And he was doing the same thing with the Tychus Epiphanies, that the Tychus Epiphanies fulfilled these prophecies 
and uh, similar ideas to what Desmond Ford had done. But I don't think that you can have a, a fulfillment of this prophecy that failed and then just another, uh, you know, plan B for the prophecy, right? So the idea is that God wrote these prophecies and they could have been fulfilled in a hundred different ways and, and they would be partly fulfilled, but because of the failure of God's people, then we can actually have a completely different interpretation of those same prophecies um, at a later date. What what say ye? Any thoughts on this? Prophecies are either fulfilled or they're not fulfilled. Now, yeah. in, the, in the situation that we have, when we look at Jonah, a warning was given to Nineveh. The warning was accepted Therefore, the prophecy was set off because the people accepted that portion of the warning. Okay. Now. That's a conditional prophecy. Conditional. Now, Uriah Smith, Desmond Ford, Leroy Froome, and several others all looked and wanted literal prophecies and did not choose to accept that a prophecy once given while it will have a literal fulfillment is not a to be literally applied so Theo is walking in the same path that Ford did that Roy Allen Anderson did, that Froome did. Now, of course, Theo wouldn't like that at all. But um, no. is he, he's trying to preserve us from all of these later interpretations. Okay. So, now, and, and we could be misunderstanding Theo on some of these points, right? Because he's not here, sort of, to defend his position. But but let's examine some of these these things a little bit more closely. So, we know that we have prophecies that Christ is going to give regarding the destructions of Jerusalem and about his coming. And those two things are tied together in Christ's language, right? Matthew 24, etc. right? I would agree. Yeah. Now, for Christians at that time, many of them would not see that Christ's second coming is so far off. They might, they might even expect it in their lifetime connected with the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, could Christ have come back the second time in connection with that history? That is, is his delay of his coming the result of the failure of Christians in his time? Or is the delay of his coming essentially a part of prophecy? That is, could the 2300 days and the 1260 years, the 2520, all those things... Could they have been fulfilled literally in connection with the, the events of the destruction of Jerusalem and Christ could have come back in, you know, let's say 74 AD, something like that? No. Okay. We, so, so Kelly says no. Now, there are some people who, who don't say no. There are some people who just believe that the, the reason why we're here today is because you know, there's failures in the past. But but I would agree with Kelly, no, because God has his purposes. He has laid out this history well in advance. And Thessalonians 2, Thessalonians 2 7, you know. Yeah, Paul Paul understands this. He understands that there is these prophecies of Daniel that are going to place the second coming of Christ far into the future. Now, some people would say, well, maybe, you know, Paul's understanding this as a day for a day, right? You know, three and a half years is three and a half, half actual years. And, and in Paul's day, you know, the temple was still standing. And, you know, uh, we know that there's three and a half years between uh, the first siege under, I uh, can't think of the guy's name, and then, then the siege, siege that Titus has. Right. So you're going to have in 70 A.D. and in 67 or 66. That's going to be Vespasian. Is that the guy's name? It's a name that pops into my head. 
Is it? What's what's the first siege in in sixty six? I believe Aspasian is correct. Okay, yeah. Just sometimes names pop into my head, and I don't know if they're correct or not. Okay, yeah. So you're going to have that, that siege in sixty six, and it's going to be three and a half years because that that first siege is going to happen in the fall of sixty six, and it, in connection with the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And then the one that happens in 70 AD begins in the spring in connection with the Passover. So it's three and a half years or 1260 days. Some people try to apply uh, that literal day for a day there um, for the three and a half years. Now, I believe it is symbolically there. But to say that Christ could have come back in that first century Cestius, that's the guy, not Vespasian. Uh, Cestius is the general. Vespasian is is Vespasian the emperor. I know he's the emperor in 70 AD. That's why the, his name comes into my head. So it's Cestius, I think. Okay, I don't do well with names. Okay, so we have here um, this idea that these this prophecy could have been fulfilled or received a partial fulfillment or something in connection with Turkey. Now, there's a danger in that because we've already seen that in the book of Daniel, this repeat of history is already being suggested that what happens in 1798-1844 is connected with what's going to happen at the end of the world. Now, it doesn't give us a date of 1989. We don't have a time prophecy tiniest to that per se though we do have the prophetic mirror and we're going to have the 1260 years from 1863 to 1989 that become part of that structure it's not explicitly laid out in daniel chapter 11 but i don't think that we could take daniel 1140 a and daniel 1140 b in any other way than we have than what weir has done in saying that we have what happens in 1798 is paralleled by the Battle of Raphia, and what happens in 1989 is paralleled by the Battle of Paneum. That is, it is already a repeat of history, which means it's already antitypical, so to speak. Does that make sense? That the events that happen in our history are the repeat of history. Amen. Okay. So this idea that, that Smith has, that you could take this Crimean War, that you could take these events that have been happening with Turkey and apply them, I don't even think they exist in a typical way of what's happening in our time. That is, Turkey cannot be a type of anything connected with the Sunday law, right? It's not just that, you know, the Adventists failed, that already... Daniel 11, verse verse 40b is talking about a response of the king of the north, which is the papacy, in connection with its rising again to power. It receives a deadly wound in 1798. And our history is the history of the healing of that deadly wound. It occurs prior to 1989, begins with the United States having this league with the papacy providing it this economic and uh, military uh, power to overthrow its enemy, the king of the south, which in this case has passed to the Soviet Union. I mean, it could be we're just so locked into our understanding of these prophecies that we can't see anything. But I, I don't see... I don't see that there is really any power in what Thiel is suggesting, that it's not it's not equal uh, to what we see happening now. That is, we have so many prophecies that point to our history in both in Daniel and Revelation and other passages of Scripture that we can easily see our repeat of Millerite history as beginning in 1989. And 9-11 becoming an empowerment of that, paralleling with August 11th, 1840. So to try to take what was happening in Uriah Smith's day 
Uriah Smith is trying to get events that he sees to fit in with that, but he has to do an injustice to the scriptures. He has to ignore many, many things. One of the things we saw that he ignores is the 2520, right? So it's something we have to consider. We have to consider because people have have proposed some similar things to our history and our movement, uh, which which I think are are different. Now, I, I believe that what's happened in our movement is typical of what's going to happen on a larger scale. That is, I don't think it's a failure of a prophecy that it could have been fulfilled in this particular way. You know, that because this movement failed, we put off Christ's second coming. I'm not I, I don't think that it didn't get fulfilled, the, the events that we predicted just because of a failure of the movement and that that could have been the fulfillment of history. I believe that our movement was meant to be typical of something that's going to happen in the future with, within the Seventh-day Adventist church. So Parminder's movement, leaving, splitting off, all those types of things. This movement becomes a, a zoom into a way mark. And that's quite a bit different than the idea that just that that some people have put forward is, well, we just failed. And so it's going to have to be fulfilled some different way. Right. That, that's how you would look at what Thiel is saying with at least some ways, at least what he's suggesting is that it could have been fulfilled in that history. Now, I what he of, says, I though. Of, yeah, I think of Na- I think of Nashville not happening because. Uh, people weren't ready. Like, you know, yeah. I just know that day I was not ready. Yeah, but but it doesn't mean that that if we were ready, that it because ifs are big things. That that somehow that that could have been fulfilled and events would have happened exactly as FFA had said they would, and you know, Christ the Sunday law would have already happened and Christ would have come back. I do think that that history was meant to be typical that that was in God's purposes, that we have to learn from that experience. I'm just thinking, the, you know, that the event itself didn't happen because we weren't ready. Yeah, yeah, we definitely weren't ready because we, we have to learn our lessons. That, I mean, God has history unfold because he's teaching lessons all, all the way along. Right? He's teaching his people as we move through history. And as we see prophecies being fulfilled. So there is a fulfillment of prophecy that that occurred in connection with this movement. It wasn't a failed prophecy as such. It's not like we got uh, there. You know, it's not like we got the wrong date for something. And it's also not like, well, uh, it failed because we failed. Right. It was it was in God's purposes the whole time. It was on a line of failed predictions. And it was pointed out to the movement, at least to Jeff and a few others, that it was on a line of failed predictions. That wasn't taken seriously enough. Now, we do have a belief, you know, that Christ could have come back before now, right? So how do we address something like that? Christ, you know, if if the Millerite movement had continued, you know, Christ could have returned. So how do we fit that in with our understanding because in a sense, he could be saying the same thing. Theo could be saying, well, you know, if they would have uh, continued on and done their work, you know, then the Crimean War could have been part of that fulfillment of that prophecy. And Turkey would have had its role at that time. Now, he's saying that Turkey's still going to have that role somehow. I'm not sure at this point exactly what he thinks is going to happen. So Christ didn't return in in the 1860s, 1870s, didn't return later. Is that because, merely because the church failed? What what does it mean Christ could have come before this? What is Ellen White saying? Does that mean that God's God's got these plan A, plan B, plan C, and these are going to continue on forever or for a long, long time? Um, I don't know. I... I know that there's a certain line that God will have to come. Mm-hmm. It seems. Why is there? A, why? Why does this? Why is this coming delayed? Yeah. I don't know. It's uh, basically he needs a people. 
100 percent. Okay, so God needs a people, and God knows the end from the beginning, right? So when we say, you know, if, we, we don't mean it really in the literalist sense that we could have changed things, right? It depends on which, which perspective we're looking at. So God is bringing us through all of these lines. One of the things that we see about this line upon line is that God has these reform lines, Right. In every age and and on every sort of um, magnification. So we can see on an individual level, we have a reform line. We can see them within a movement. We can see them within a church. We can see them within nations. We can see them within the events of history as they unfold. And these reform lines show God's dealing with man. And we have major reform lines like the Millerite movement or uh, the three decrees. Right. These are major reform lines, the beginning of the 2300 days, starting with, you know, Cyrus's decree, then Darius's, then Artaxerxes. They parallel the history of the three angels messages. So Millerite history is a major reform line. And our history is a repeat of Millerite history. We have a major reform line that addresses, you know, 1989, 9-11, Sunday law, etc. And. In each of these reform lines, God is reforming. He's giving us light, right? There's some kind of darkness that we're in. God gives us light, and that light advances. And as we accept that light, God can give us more light. And so all of these are God's purposes to bring light to the world. This movement is part of God's reform lines. It's to bring light to the world, to Adventism. That's the purpose of it. Now, is it the only reform line that exists? Is it the only movement that God is using? God's probably using other people all over the world. But we can see it is a major reform line. It is, there. we're part, we're zoomed into 9-11. This movement is about 9-11, right? So it's, it's a zoom into a waymark of event that's happened of a worldwide character that's affected the world. That bigger reform line, you know, where we have 1989 and 9-11 and we have the Sunday law, Jeff's sort of, you know, earlier reform lines. You know, originally he didn't have 9-11 in there. He had, you know, 1989, the Sunday law, the close of probation. That was his reform line. But that's still just to zoom into the Sunday law, Revelation 18, that Ellen White saw at the end of the world. She doesn't see 1989, 9-11, and all the events that's happened within our movement. She doesn't see those things as she sees them as afar a off. She can see the mighty angel of Revelation 18 is going to come down. But she doesn't see all the details, right? We're now living in those details. And so we see those details as a reform line. But she does say, you know, that's the second angel. And if you to have a third, you have to a first and a second. To have a second, you have to have a first. So we can see that as we've experienced this, it's not something that Ellen White would have seen in the way that we see it. But still, it's consistent with what Ellen White saw, right? So on her reform line, she doesn't have all of the details of our reform line. But our, but she does, in a sense, because she says they're going to be repeated. That is the parable of the ten virgins is going to be repeated to the very letter. And she clearly marks the parable of the ten virgins as the first and second angel's messages. So we see things here that that David Thiel doesn't see. And I'm not sure if I'm, you know, characterizing his view perfectly. He'd probably have some things to say about what we're saying. But, um, you know, it's pretty clear to me that uh, he's not considering Weir's view and that if he considered Weir's view, he would have a much different uh, way of addressing it, if he's going to address it at all. So he, we'll just finish off a little bit, some, reading some of this here. White's earliest published view in 1847 may have been a reaction to what he saw as a dangerous practice implemented by Miller and Litch. Perhaps he thought of the resulting great disappointment when positiveness of interpretation going unfulfilled can only end in broken and forsaken faith, since many forsook the movement after Christ did not return at that time. 
However, White appears to exaggerate the importance of his King of the North position in relation to his remark. Positions taken upon the Eastern question are based upon prophecies which have not yet their fulfillment. Here we should tread lightly and take positions carefully, lest we be found removing the landmarks fully established by the Advent movement. At a time when White's health had been affected by overwork, he magnifies the papacy for the role of the King of the North as though it were a landmark fully established before 1847. Only six years later, Nichols' view, be more consistent with Miller and Lich as presented before the Great Disappointment, proves the landmark less settled than what White would have us believe. If Daniel 11 interpretations is what he even meant by landmark, as we are peers to conclude. Okay, so this is poorly written, so I'm not sure exactly what he's saying. Some bad sentences here. But the argument underlying this, uh, there's a number of things that he's doing. So he's going to bring in James White's health, right? Why, why is he doing that? Okay, so he's bringing in, in James White's health. Why is he doing that? What does that have to do with anything? It's called muddying the waters, right? So he's not really, really looking at James White's argument. He's not weighing the evidence. He's not really presenting James White's argument, you know, fully. He's just saying, you know, James White has some health problems. Here's his motivations, right? So all through this, we can see that uh, Field likes to mind read. Correct? No, Thiel likes to assume that he can mind read. Okay. Right. So he likes to he, he likes to believe that he can read minds. He can he can he can look at uh, Weir's motives, he can look at James White's motives. We never once seen him actually uh, mind reading uh, Uriah Smith in any negative sense. Right? But Weir and White Obviously, their minds aren't clear. They got kind of emotional things happening. So there's there's a phrase to ascribe motives to someone. I'm not sure what the word for that is, but to ascribe or attribute motives to someone. Yeah. Well, mind reading. Yeah, it's mind reading. And, and, you know, we do this to people all the time. And, and, and we've had it done to us where people will... Uh, the reason why you're saying such and such a thing is because of something that happened to you or whatever, you know, some emotional reason of why you're saying this. And I know from personal experience that the vast majority of times when people do mind reading of me, they're completely wrong. And I've had people do mind reading based upon, you know, my facial expressions when something was said or something they thought I said or they misheard that I said. Um, and I find it kind of remarkable that people do this instead of looking at an argument itself, right? Instead of looking at the evidence itself. Now, I was going to say that you could turn that, I, I can turn that on myself even. I can think I can read my motives, but often they're revealed later on in a crisis. What are, are my wow. character, right? You know, I, I think I know myself, but really I don't. Right. So, so one of the things, yeah. So one of the things I say sometimes in that regard is, you know, we hardly know ourselves. How can we expect that we know other people? Right. Right. That's right. But realizing we don't know ourselves is a little bit of a journey. Yeah. So here, you know, when I look at James White's arguments, it's just that James White is being consistent. The papacy is the final power. Why are we looking at Turkey? It's, it's unfulfilled prophecy. We know that these are things that are still going to happen in the future. If we're going to make any predictions regarding those things, they should be consistent within the other lines of prophecy. So anyway, we will come back to this tomorrow. And uh, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today. Even though it got off to a bit of a slow start, we know, Lord, that you have your purposes and the things that you are teaching us. And uh, we ask that you can be with us throughout this day. Help us in our personal walk and the struggles that we face. 
Help us to keep before our minds uh, your word that we can recognize that you have purposes uh, in our lives uh, to reflect Christ's character. We ask for your spirit to work upon our hearts and to show us our sin. Uh, We pray for David Thiel and his family, and we pray for Adventists who are searching for truth, and we ask that you can watch over them and that uh, you can guide them into all truth. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.